There is no doubt that Alucard is one of the most iconic anime characters of all time. His red trench coat and hat, his castle and jackal, his unhinged swagger when committing the absolute definition of mad slaughter, there are many reasons why people love Alucard. But the most important reason, in our minds at least, is that Alucard is a vampire that kicks ass first and takes names later. Much like Blade, who is also a vampire that hunts down supernatural creatures like himself, Alucard too is sworn to take down Helsing's inhuman enemies until he runs out of lives or they run out of existence. But unlike Blade, who only possesses what you would call the typical vampire powers, it's clear that Alucard is levels above any other blood-sucking villain of his ilk. And it all comes down to his anatomy, so let's take a deep dive into that, shall we? In this video, we'll explain to you how Count Dracula became a vampire in the first place, how his powers work, what their limits are, and more. This is Alucard's anatomy, explore. Lord. He started off as a regular human, though perhaps that isn't an entirely accurate description. Alucard's life as Vlad the Impaler. If you guys have only seen the Studio Gonzo version of Helsing, then we don't blame you for feeling a bit confused by the revelation that takes place towards the end. As Alucard corners Incognito and fills up Jackal with pure silver, the vampire from the Dark Continent screams out in terror and asks him who he really is. Though Alucard doesn't answer, we get a brief flash that shows us his previous identity as a middle-aged man with unkempt hair, a beard, a mustache, and the wild oldest eyes you've ever seen. After this, the screen cuts to black, and we don't exactly see how Alucard finishes off Incognito, but in the aftermath of their battle, we do see Incognito's body impaled from bowel through throat with a silver spear, thus confirming that Alucard was indeed Vlad the Impaler. Helsing Ultimate was a lot less subtle about it, just straight up confirming that Alucard was Vlad the Impaler towards the end of the series when he summons elite Wallachian cavalrymen to turn the tide against Millennium and Iscariot, but this means that we have our starting point for the video. Alucard began his life as a human being, more specifically, as the son of Vlad Dracul II. That's right, the famous vampire named after that Voivoid Dracula who won his name against the Turk over the Great River on the very frontier of Turkey Land, according to Abraham Van Helsing's assessment in Bram Stoker's seminal piece of fiction, is based on a factual inaccuracy. But to be fair to the man, he wasn't exactly an expert on Wallachian history, and the internet was not a thing in the 19th century, so that isn't necessarily his bad. Vlad the Impaler was the son of Vlad Dracul, and was alternatively known as Vlad Dracula or Vlad Tepish, with the latter half of the pseudonym translating to the Impaler in Romanian. If you guys know anything about history, then you might have heard about the horror stories that Vlad the Impaler subjected his enemies, and even his own subjects to. There is an infamous story about how Vlad once left 20,000 Ottoman men in a garden of impaled corpses as a warning to Sultan Mehmed II, who was known for his penchant for psychological psychological warfare. The Ottomans were shocked by Vlad's actions, and he was also said to have a fondness for impalement as his primary method of execution and torture. But actual history suggests that Vlad was practically tricked into a sibling rivalry. His younger brother Radu grew up in the Ottoman royal court, because when they were young, both Vlad and Radu were given over to the Ottomans by their father as part of a peace treaty. When Vlad grew up, he was sent off to Wallachia to rule as its voivode, while Radu stayed in Constantinople and rose through the ranks of the court, eventually becoming a powerful Janissary leader and the Sultanate's favored candidate for becoming the new voivode of Wallachia because of Vlad's extreme methods of justice. During his lifetime, the Impaler ruled over Wallachia thrice, forced stalemates with the mighty Ottoman armies, even getting close to assassinating Mehmed II himself during the night attack at Tragoviste, and generally he gave no quarter to an enemy he knew was always going to be much stronger than him. Despite being the rightful heir to the throne, Vlad spent his life locked in struggles over it with his brother and his cousins, and in the end, he died on the battlefield, with accounts of his death being disputed by various accounts. Vlad the Impaler was a cruel leader, sure, but he was also a man intent on breaking the hold of the aristocracy over Wallachian leadership, and his one-man crusade against the boyars is what ended up leading to his downfall. The reason he gets such a terrifying reputation is because his atrocities were a poetic flourish by the Transylvanian Saxons, and while we are sure that Vlad the Impaler did commit atrocities against them, they were probably nowhere near as gruesome as a contemporary work about a mischievous tyrant called Dracula made him see 
team at the time. Seriously, go read the way Dracula is described in that work and you'll think that the dude must have also written the screenplays for the human centipede. But enough of the history lesson, the point we're trying to make was that Alucard, or rather Dracula, was a warrior and a ruler who lived a human life and died a human death in real history. Kota Hirano's Helsing is fiction, however, so of course things play out differently over there. Hirano has admitted in interviews that all he has created in Helsing, he has created out of his passion as an otaku, so expecting historical accuracy was never really the main concern. But he does manage to stick to the script for the most part. In Hirano's world, when Vlad was taken hostage by the Ottoman Sultan, he ended up being violated by the man. There are no historical records that prove that this actually happened in real life, but it wouldn't be a stretch to think so given all of this is quite literally medieval history. His brother isn't even mentioned in the series because, honestly, we don't think Hirano knew about Radu, but Radu wouldn't have been relevant to the story anyways because, from this point forward, the two Vlads that have been the subject of this video begin to separate. We've already summed up what happened in the real world, so let's look at what Hirano came up with now. When he returned to Wallachia and assumed the throne, Vlad the Impaler became a fierce believer in God and believed himself to be a warrior of God. He believed that his harsh treatment of his subjects and criminals alike was justified because he was just doing so in the name of the Father above. Too late he realized that he was really just doing it for himself and that his only purpose for living was a deep fear of dying. Vlad's inhumane treatment of foes and civilians alike was a projection of the assault he himself had faced in life. But because projection does literally nothing to improve your life beyond giving you a temporary adrenaline rush, in the end, Vlad was left to contend with his sins and fears all by himself. In the final stand of Vlad the Impaler, only 2,000 men showed up to support his cause against the Ottomans, most of which were peasantry. The Impaler's peasant army was crushed by the Ottomans, and Vlad himself was mortally wounded. As he lay there dying, his intense desire to live trumped over his physical existence itself and triggered an event that can either be called miraculous or monstrous. As Vlad the Impaler lay on the ground cursing God and everyone besides himself for his fate, the blood of his allies and enemies started pooling around around him. Due to heavy blood loss, Vlad instinctively drinks the blood, which triggers his transformation into the first ever vampire. At that moment, Vlad denies death and drinks the blood of the fallen. Their souls end up getting sucked into his body and transform him into Bram Stoker's Count Dracula, a menacing Transylvanian nobleman with a dark and terrible secret. Vlad clears out the Ottoman army and sets up base at Bran Castle in Brasov, which lay at the border of Wallachia in Transylvania, and began his reign of terror over the region up until Dr. Abraham Van Helsing and his crew managed to take him down. But here too, once again, details are shuffled around by Hirano to fit his narrative. There are two major differences between Kota Hirano's Dracula and Bram Stoker's Dracula. Number one, Dracula didn't kidnap Mina Harker, they fell in love in Hirano's version. And number two, Dracula didn't die after his fight with Dr. Abraham Van Helsing. The good doctor took the near-deceased Count's body back with him to Britain, where he experimented upon him with science and sorcery to create the ultimate living weapon against all kinds of evil creatures. It is unclear just why Dracula agreed to serve the Helsing family and acknowledged Abraham and his descendants as his master but the most likely answer is respect. If you've seen Helsing, you know Alucard respects people who resist turning into beasts like himself. And so he must have been overjoyed at the fact that a person who was proud to be a human being managed to subdue him. After being turned into the Helsing organization's ace in the hole, Alucard begins a new crusade against supernatural beings. But it's clear that his existence has changed quite a bit. This is where the anatomical breakdown becomes relevant, so let's jump right into it. Quite literally built different. What separates Alucard's anatomy from the rest of vampire kind? Initially, we're pretty sure there was no difference between the Dracula that we know and the Dracula Hirano created. After becoming a vampire, Vlad gained every power and weakness that you guys might know of through popular media. Nighttime and full moons are good, and silver crosses and sunlight are bad. We actually don't know about garlic because that was never really mentioned in Stoker's original work, but we do know that sacramental bread can at least harm Dracula's fledglings. He could hypnotize people, drink their blood to turn them into his minions or full-fledged vampires, and could even shapeshift into fog, mist, or a massive black dog that looks like a hellhound. But if you've seen Helsing, you'll know that none of the traditional vampire weaknesses like sunlight or holy weapons hold any sway over Alucard. In fact, he takes the idea of an immortal Nosferatu introduced by Stoker quite literally, as he will never die so long as he has his souls stocked up inside of him. According to Helsing, 
Helsing canon, the entire reason why Dr. Abraham Van Helsing was able to defeat Dracula was that he took out his entire army and everyone under his service before he went for the Count himself. Dr. Van Helsing stabbed Dracula in the heart with a silver stake, and he was presumed dead from that point onwards, at least by the world. See, instead of completely eradicating the inhuman creature from existence, Dr. Abraham Van Helsing took Dracula back to London with him, as we mentioned at the end of the last section, and he used his own knowledge of the occult to turn Alucard into a freak of nature. By binding his body and the souls within it using special symbols and restrictions, Abraham Van Helsing was able to bypass the limitations of the average vampire and create an entity that was essentially indestructible. Alucard's real physiology isn't that of a tall, slender man with wild hair and pronounced canines. He's actually just a shapeless mass of black energy outlined with blood red and seemingly covered in eyes. He has mentioned on multiple occasions that he can take any form he wishes, which is the explanation for his infamous girly card form and any others that he assumes as well. After being reinforced by magics beyond his own, Alucard essentially becomes indestructible to the very things that could have harmed him or disabled him in his previous life. As Dracula, the Count was susceptible to becoming inactive during broad daylight, and even though sunlight didn't actually kill him in the original novel, turning him inert was the next worst thing it could have done. Also, Dracula could not regenerate his wounds by drinking the blood of another, only his youth. Alucard possesses that ability as well. Not only can he regenerate his own body at command using the souls trapped within himself, he can also expand his supply by draining more people of their blood and soul, which essentially makes him the worst kind of immortal being imaginable. One of the things that made Dracula such a scary figure was the telepathic link he had established with Mina Harker, though that seemed to only take place when both parties had ingested each other's blood. Alucard can telepathically communicate with Saras with no difficulty, and it even goes beyond that in certain cases. He also receives the memories of the person whose blood he drinks, which is how he's able to confirm the existence and plans of Millennium in the main manga and OVA series. And speaking of Millennium, none of their artificial vampires or werewolves can even match up to Alucard because of their sheer anatomical flaws. Most Millennium foot soldiers are at the level of the Cheddar Priest at best, including Jan Valentine. Luke Valentine was far stronger than his brother, but he was still nowhere near Alucard's level because he couldn't even regenerate himself like the real no-like king. Rip Van Winkle and Tubal Cain Alhambra were basically fodder, and though he didn't come up against her, we're sure Alucard would have whipped Zorn Blitz in a matter of seconds and shown her how to play some real mind games with his own superior illusionary powers. In fact, so advanced is Alucard's regenerative ability that he often allows his opponent to blow him to bits before piecing himself back together and laying into them just to mess with their minds. Sometimes he'll even fire off bullets with his dismembered limbs, which is again something no other vampire has been shown to be capable of doing. Alucard also doesn't need to drink blood to keep himself active all the time, but if he does go without a feeding for a few years, he'll fall into a death sleep from which he can only be awakened by giving him blood. During this death sleep, Alucard pretty much enters a state of stasis, whereby his body doesn't move, but his mind is active enough to the point where it can recognize the smell and taste of blood and react to it. Once awakened, Alucard needs to drink blood until he reaches his full capacity, after which it's pretty much unreadable just how much he needs to feed to keep going. His existence is quite different from other vampires because, as the OG Drac, Alucard is sustained by the souls of his familiars, who are just as much a part of his anatomy as his jack or castle. Because of Helsing's experiments, Alucard is no longer as vulnerable to holy weapons as he once was, which is proven in his fight with Alexander Anderson where he is able to regenerate himself despite the latter's holy bayonets slashing him to bits and then stabbing the bits as well. Though holy bayonets and scripture barriers affect Alucard's movement and power output, they do not affect his immortal essence. And speaking of Castle and Jackal, the fact that Alucard can even wield those pistols is evidence of his superior physical strength in and of itself, because those guns weigh 4 and 16 kilos respectively, making his handheld loadout upwards of 40 pounds in terms of weight. By contrast, the world's heaviest sniper rifle, the Ukrainian Snipex Alligator, weighs about 50 pounds. Let that sink in for a second. Alucard has also wielded a Tommy gun before, especially during World War II when he was deployed to Warsaw alongside a young Walter C. Dornes. But in the current timeline, these two guns are 
are his preferred weapons for hunting. And this isn't because Alucard has such a fondness for guns that he has an NRA membership, it's just that it's cleaner to get the job done this way. The only time Alucard switches from conventional weaponry to supernatural weaponry is when his opponent is worthy enough of it. And this is where the true prowess of his inhuman anatomy truly shines. Control Art Restriction System, Alucard's true powers, and the only limitation to his immortality. When Alucard is faced with an enemy that's too strong for him to face via conventional means, he will begin an incantation which feels more like a personal mantra than a ritualistic requirement, but it might as well be the latter. The Control Art Restriction System was designed to contain Alucard's immense powers after the enhancements Helsing gave him, and it divides his supernatural energy into six levels. With each ascending numerical level corresponding with a higher output and power. Though we're sure he can deal with most above average fodder by staying at level 6, for the vampires created by Millennium like Luke Valentine, Alucard would often have to release nearly all of his power. And to do that, it appears that Abraham Van Helsing had a protocol put in place. Whenever Alucard feels like he's going up against something that requires level 1 treatment, he states that he's releasing the control art restrictions up to level 1 in accordance with the Cromwell invocation up until the target of the release has been exterminated. This might feel like exposition when you see it or read it, but we think it's an actual requirement for Alucard to release his restrained powers, because otherwise, the point of having a 6 level binding vow becomes kind of redundant. The Cromwell invocation is probably a reference to Oliver Cromwell, the cunning 17th century English statesman who went on to become Lord Protector of the Isles. However, once Alucard gets on level 1, it becomes clear that Stan Standing up to him is next to impossible, because protection is the last thing on his mind. Luke Valentine was one of Millennium's strongest vampires, created specifically to defeat Alucard. But he died like a whimpering little pup when Alucard broke his legs and sicked his Baskerville familiar on the man to completely devour him. He can also summon other familiars at level 1, and his body becomes almost fluidic, oozing with immense power and bloodlust. Alucard's mere presence at level 1 is enough to shock most of his enemies into fear but it is what comes after that truly sets him apart from every other vampire. On extremely rare occasions, like when the world is ending or an army of vampire Nazis are invading London and massacring everyone in sight, the director of Helsing seems to reserve the right to invoke Level Zero. When Integra invokes Level Zero, she tells Alucard to properly introduce himself before completing his mission, search and destroy. Alucard then busts out a line from infamous alchemist George Ripley's Ripley Scroll, calling himself the bird of Hermes and claiming that he was eating his own wings to make himself tame. Once he finishes this incantation, Alucard can unleash literally every familiar stored inside of him, including Millennium Vampires, Ottoman Soldiers, everyone whose blood he has consumed in his centuries-long existence, and even elite Wallachian cavalrymen, whose blood he had drunk right before his human life ended. Once Alucard releases all his familiars, he temporarily reverts to his original appearance as Vlad the Impaler, and executes a brutal finishing move, whereby he recreates the Garden of the Impaled we mentioned at the start of this video, only this time in the middle of London. But what is his greatest strength is also his greatest limitation. The reason why Alucard is different from other vampires is because of the sheer wealth of familiars he had. This is why Anderson had to become a literal regenerator to even stand a chance against him, and why none of Millennium's vampires came back once they were defeated. So once he deploys all of his familiars, he becomes vulnerable in a way. This is why the Major held back his own trump card until Alucard had used his. After allowing the No-Life King to massacre most of his and Iscariot's soldiers, the Major sends in the newly vampirized Walter to finish off Alucard. Or at least that's how he makes it seem. The real purpose of sending Walter out was not to make him the final act, but to use him as this setup for it. Alucard's encounter with Walter was pretty one-sided all things considered, but he did end up losing a lot of his life force due to his usually reckless style of fighting. He ended up having to regenerate himself after dealing with Walter, and the blood and souls of 3 million people would usually be a highly nutritious meal for a vampire boy, but not when it was spiked with a lethal dose of Schrodinger. See, the Major knew the nature of a vampire because at one point in his life, he too had been given the chance to become one. While he rejected it, preferring
endeavoring to preserve his humanity instead, the Major did become obsessed with learning the secret to creating and killing a true vampire without certainty. That's when he commissioned the Doctor to create Schrodinger, a boyish entity with feline ears whose existence was defined by the principle of Schrodinger's cat. So long as Warrant Officer Schrodinger was aware of his own existence, he could be anywhere and nowhere at the same time, making him practically omnipresent. But the moment he forgets who he is, he will cease to exist, just like Schrodinger's cat. When Alucard starts drinking in the blood of every dead creature within London, the Major commands Schrodinger to commit suicide and join the blood flow. By doing so, once Schrodinger is absorbed by Alucard, his consciousness would mix with the other three million souls the No-Life King had taken within himself, and he would forget to exist, thereby taking Alucard along with him as well. This is the only real limitation to Alucard's power as an immortal Nosferatu, and Millennium had to spend literally half a century to come up with this solution. It was an idea that would make Light Yagami feel like he was Matsuda. We'll admit that much in the Major's favor, but he severely underestimated Alucard's personal tenacity. It might have taken him 30 years to do so, but Alucard managed to kill every soul that lived within his ethereal self, and leave only Schrodinger alive, which consequently imbued him with his omnipresent abilities. Now that he can be anywhere and nowhere all at once, there is no real limitation to Alucard's powers anymore. As long as he drinks medicated blood and avoids taking in a person's soul when he kills them, he can spend the rest of eternity as a vampire that can phase in and out of reality itself, and it's all thanks to his insane anatomy. Marvelous Verdict. But as for this video, we're afraid that's gonna have to be it. Alucard is a fascinating character from a physical and psychological perspective, but his physiology is what makes him so iconic in our opinion. If he wasn't able to tank multiple rounds that would usually shred the plating off an armored panzer, would Helsing even feel half as exciting as it does? But that's just our opinion. We're curious to see what you think about it, so let us know your thoughts in the comments section down below. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you guys in the next one.